Hello, this is Carl Irwin with episode 6 of Hacking the Viewport, a series that I've been uh, putting out, a tutorial series uh, that is covering the uh, options that we have with rendering an OpenGL and GLSL inside of the uh, Blender viewport. Uh, the last few episodes we've looked at a number of different things. We've stepped away from this original project for a couple of episodes uh, to look at uh, some new features that are being implemented in, uh, in the Gooseberry build of Blender. Uh, we've also looked at uh, the uh, things that we have to do to use uh, alpha transparency properly in Blender. We've looked at uh, an add-on that helps us with the draw order issue uh, in in the viewport. Uh, but we're going to move our way back to this original project and we're going to look more at the solid objects that you see inside of this uh, scene here. So let me play back this original video. You can see we have this planetary uh, sort of object here with some uh, asteroids, a small asteroid field, and you can notice a number of things uh, in the scene. Uh, we've uh, we have this nebula figure which we looked at in episode two, I believe, and some of the lens flare issues we've also looked at. Uh, we've looked at uh, the star field as well, uh, and uh, compositing uh, these types of images together inside of the viewport. Uh, but on the objects, you can see that there is uh, some shading and some lighting that's going on. There's also ambient occlusion, which at the time that this project was made was not really possible uh, inside of the viewport. Uh, however, since uh, the addition of some of the new features in the Gooseberry build of, uh, of Blender, uh, you can now add uh, some sorts of ambient occlusion and uh, depth of field as well. Um, that feature, as you've seen in the recent tutorials, is not uh, perfect quite yet. It's still uh, sort of in development, but very promising uh, and very helpful. Uh, I want to show you how this was originally done, however, today. We're going to look at shadeless materials, and we're not going to use any uh, lighting, really, in this scene. This scene used all shadeless materials uh, when it was put together. There's no uh, real lighting going on in here. And uh, we're going to use a couple of hacks and tricks to get this uh, ambient occlusion sort of look. Uh, and uh, we're going to use uh, methods that you may not even be thinking of. You may be aware of the uh, vector paint system inside of Blender and the dirty vertex uh, options that we have. Um, we're not going to use that. That's not how this was done. That's also a very good option. We may look at that again uh, at some point uh, in the future. But uh, we're going to use uh, light masking, which we looked a little bit at in one of the early episodes, uh, using actual point lights uh, and light sources to uh, provide uh, three-dimensional uh, volumetric sorts of masks in our scenes uh, to change our materials. So uh, anyway, let's get right into it. Uh, this is uh, what we're going to make, hopefully, sort of. Uh, we're using the um, one of the more current versions of uh, Blender 2.72, and this is a Gooseberry build. I also have enabled on here, we're not going to use it probably, uh, but I have the uh, GLSL tool uh, kit that's being uh, uh, created, and I, I mentioned this on one of the earlier episodes, so please go back and look at that uh, to uh, find where you can uh, get this at. Um, but let's, uh, let's put together a planet here. Uh, we're going to change our view. We're going to go to the front. We will uh, uh, move our camera. We'll line it to the... Uh, uh, active uh, the active camera to the view that we're looking at we'll move it up on the z-axis a little bit and we're going to get rid of our default cube we're not going to need that we're going to get rid of the light that's in the scene we're not going to need that either uh, i'm going to add a, an icosphere uh, we're not going to subdivide it right now we're just going to leave it the way it is i'll enlarge it just a little bit and uh, before we forget let's enable our glsl shading so if we go to shading uh, under uh, multi-texture, we'll uh, change that to GLSL. Here you can see these new features, uh, ambient occlusion, depth of field, uh, that have been added to the uh, Gooseberry build. If you want this Gooseberry build, you can get it uh, at uh, blender.org. Go to the uh, development page and you can find uh, current builds, daily builds, and you'll find uh, the uh, Gooseberry builds under that page. They come out almost every single day. There's a new one. Um, <clears throat> you don't need to use the Gooseberry build for what we're doing today. We're not going to use any of these features. Everything uh, that we're going to do is on the uh, uh, current uh, 2.72 uh, build of Blender. Uh, let's change our viewport to uh, texture view. 
and we are going to add a couple of modifiers to our icosphere. Let's add uh, a <coughs> subdivision surface modifier. We're going to bump this up to uh, 5. Uh, not that it matters concerning the render versus view. We really are using the view because we're using the viewport, uh, but we want that to be up to 5. Uh, and we're going to add a new material. Let's add a shadeless material. Uh, we don't have to change anything about it. We're going to be using textures on top of this material. Uh, and we're going to add uh, a... Let's add a texture very quickly so we can see what we're doing. So we'll add a new texture slot. We're going to use a shadeless texture. This is a pack of textures that I have put together. I created these in GIMP. You could do the same in Photoshop or whatever photo editor that you use. And these are uh, textures that uh, will represent different lighting and, and shadow type schemes. Uh, we're going to use one of these shadow schemes that we have here. I have four of them. And what this is, is it's a gradient from a black to alpha transparent, bottom to top, which would imply shadow on the bottom of our objects. And then I have uh, three other versions of this one with the gradient on the left, one with the gradient on the right, uh, which would indicate shadow on the left or right. And also one with shadow on the top, gradient starting from the top for underlighting if we uh, would need that in our scene. Uh, let's grab onto one of these. And uh, the way you use these is you're going to apply them much like you would a uh, captured material. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I invite you to look at episode 5 where I talk briefly about matte caps. Uh, these are essentially matte caps that would be applied using the normal texture coordinates. So we'll apply the normal texture coordinate and we'll decrease the size a little bit on the uh, X and Y axis, just one click to 0.9. And you can see that it implies that there's a shadow on the bottom of our object. This will help us to see our geometry a little bit as we uh, do some of our modeling. So let's uh, apply another modifier. We're going to apply a displacement modifier to this. We'll add a new texture. By default it will apply a an image texture. We want to change that to the old default which used to be clouds. You can see that it gives us this bumpy kind of surface. Uh, also, before we forget, we're going to change our shading to smooth for this object. <clears throat> Under the uh, cloud texture, we're going to uh, change our size. We're going to uh, bump it up to, let's say, 1. And uh, let's go to the uh, colors, and we're going to add the ramp option. And we're going to bring our white, our high end, down quite a bit. And see, we'll see what happens as we move this. It will start to uh, bring out uh, the high end, and it, it creates kind of these divots in there. Actually, I'm going to go back to our size. We're going to decrease our size a little bit. Let's go down to 0 0.5. Uh, maybe 0 0.75, which might be kind of closer to where we started. Uh, we're going to bring our uh, dark side, the blacks, up a little bit. So let's increase those. And actually, I think I, think I want to take the size back down to 0.5 closer to the default that we had. Uh, and let's uh, bring our whites up a little bit, bring our blacks up a little bit. So what we're doing is we're creating this uh, kind of a crevice sort of look. We can rotate this on the z-axis and you can see uh, kind of what we've made here, uh, kind of similar to what we started with. Um, yeah, that looks okay. Uh, let's, let's maybe bring this down to 0 0.25, which may be really close to where we had it originally. Yeah, that's a little bit better, a few more crevices, more like what we, uh, had in the original. Um, so this is how we model it. We're kind of done with this now. We've done all of the modeling that we need to for the, uh, planetary, uh, object, and we can rotate this in any, 
any direction you see how this has been applied to it. So we have kind of a spherical object with a bunch of uh, uh, crevices and, and gaping uh, holes in it. And, uh, and we start to see uh, the formation of some shadow on it. Now it's not realistic because you can see on the underside where we have some shadow, there's light. Uh, and that's because this is a normal uh, map that's been applied to it. We're going to take care of that uh, a little bit better here in a moment. Let's add uh, a few more uh, shadows to this. So we'll select our material. We'll make another uh, texture slot. And we're going to just grab the same texture, the same bottom shadow texture. Uh, again, we will apply this as a normal and uh, normal mapping. And we'll decrease the size a little bit. And let's create one more texture. We underneath this, we'll apply another one, create a new slot, and we'll uh, go back to our library of uh, shadeless uh, textures. We're going to grab one with a shadow on the right because our our lighting is going to come more from the left hand side. So let's open that up, and we will apply this uh, also as a normal map. And we'll decrease the size a little bit. So now we've got kind of a lighting that's more to the upper left quadrant on our sphere, which is where our lighting is going to come from in the scene. We still have not solved our problems with the uh, lighting, and the interior lighting and the ambient occlusion. We'll do that shortly. Uh, let's uh, get some of the rest of the shadeless uh, shadeless material set up here. We're going to bump our shadow textures down a little bit. And actually, for a while here, let's uh, bring our subdivisions down a little bit just so our, our we can move a little bit quicker. Uh, that's the benefit to using modifiers. And let's uh, move down the other textures as well. So we'll take our shadow textures down, give us our, a little bit of room to work with. And on the top slot, let's add a rock texture. We're going to use this for... Uh, a sort of bump mapping. So uh, I found a couple of these uh, rock textures on cgtextures.com. I think that's where I got this one from. And I think we'll need to bring up our mapping a little bit. This is a kind of repeating texture. We're going to apply this texture to a UV coordinate. And uh, unfortunately, we haven't uh, uh, UV mapped this yet so, yet. so let's tab into edit mode. We'll go to the shading UV side, and uh, we will select Smart UV Project. Click on OK, and I'll tab out of edit mode. You can see that now our texture has been applied. I think we want to uh, increase the size a little bit, so let's increase it by 1.5 on the x-axis, 1.5 on the y-axis. And uh, we're going to select uh, also the geometry option for this texture. But we're going to decrease it to 0.1, so it's going to apply a little bit of bump mapping to it. And that will actually catch our shadeless lighting uh, textures and apply them uh, more realistically uh, on our object. Uh, let's add another uh, texture to this, another shadeless texture. We'll go to our uh, shadeless lighting pack again. And we're going to grab this texture here that has an orangey kind of color on the left and a bluish color on the right, dark color on the bottom. And this will uh, again be applied sort of as a matte cap using normals. And it will imply a light, a bluish light coming from the left, uh, or rather an orange light coming from the upper left quadrant and a bluish light coming from the upper right. But we're going to decrease the lighting, uh, or rather the color influence, to 0.1. And we're going to change this to an add uh, blend mode. And it's very subtle. You can't really notice it. But it does add a little bit to our scene. It gives us a little bit of a, a, an ambient lighting that, that looks a little bit uh, contrasted on the left to the right. Orange on the left, blue on the right. And uh, that looks good. Good for now. Let's bring our shadows down a little bit more, a couple more spots to give ourselves a little bit more room to add a few more uh, options here. We're going to add a highlight, sort of a backlight, uh, a rim backlight look to this. So let's uh, add another texture. And we'll go to our shadeless lighting pack again. And I'm going to uh, grab this uh, light here that it's it's listed as a Fresnel, and what this is used is if it was mapped as a normal map, it would apply kind of this uh, light uh, fall off that could be used 
uh, as lighting, or it could be used as a mask or mat, which would give the normals that are facing away from our camera view uh, a, a white color, and the normals facing the camera would be more of a, a dark a black color. So I'm going to select this one, and uh, I will apply this as well as a, a normal map. And we will uh, decrease the size a little bit as well. And you can see it gives us kind of this rim look to it. Uh, the shade, uh, the shading uh, shadow mats are covering it. You can see on the left and right. Uh, but I want to make it a little bit more stark. So we're going to uh, move this, offset it a little bit. Let's uh, see which way we need to go. We'll offset it on the x-axis as 0 0.01, and then I will offset it, actually let's make that a little bit more, 0 0.05, and then we'll offset it on the y, uh, 0 0.05, and that will give us sort of this edge this bright edge on the upper left quadrant. And we're going to apply this uh, as an add mode. You can see what it does to our object. It adds a little bit more of a, uh, a backlight, rim edge light sort of look to our object. Okay. Uh, now we're going to uh, snap our cursor to the selected right in the middle of it. And we're going to add another object. We will create a point light. Now, these are shadeless objects, so this point light really doesn't have an effect on our material. Uh, but we are going to add a sphere fa uh, fall off, kind of a, a, a boundary to it, so that at uh, 25 blender units, this would fall off and end. We're going to decrease the size down to 3. Let's see where that puts us. Let's bring that up to 4. And we want to bring this so that it kind of comes to the edge. Let me bring that back down to 3. Uh, three again. And I'm going to decrease the size of our uh, icosphere. Before I do that, let me parent my point to the icosphere. It's going to go along with it. And I'm going to decrease the size of the icosphere so that it kind of comes to the edge, just to the edge of that light. And we'll go back to our light settings and we're going to, um, let's bump the energy up to two. Uh, now we're going to go back to our icosphere and our material settings, and we're going to add another material. We have our first material that we made. We're going to call this a rock material. Uh, and then I'm going to add another material slot, and we'll add a new material. We're going to call this our light mask material. And this material is going to be shaded. It's not going to be shadeless. We're going to get rid of all the specularity. We're going to increase the intensity all the way up to 1. We're going to change the color all the way up to white, absolute white. And we're going to change the uh, shade model from a Lambert to Fresnel. Now this is kind of a waxy sort of uh, material so that light can pass through it. It does not cast shadow on itself. Uh, it will accept lights uh, sort of a, in a... Uh, in a subsurface scattered sort of way. And this is what the material that we want to use to apply a mask uh, the way we're going to. Uh, we're going to go back to our rock texture. And this is a very important texture that we just created, this light mask, because it can be used multiple times on many different objects in the same way in our scene. Uh, so uh, this is not unique just to our planet. You could use this again uh, later on for other objects. So you want to make sure that it has that light mask uh, sort of name to it. It's not just associated with our, our planet. Go back to the rock texture. We're going to apply uh, nodes to this one. You can see our material disappears. So we need to open up the node editor. And we'll open up our node editor. And in the node editor we're going to uh, <coughs> apply our rock texture. And we'll see it reappear again. But we're going to apply another material to this uh, uh, node setup. We'll add a new material, and inside of this material, we will select our uh, light mask. And if I apply the light mask to our material output, you'll see what happens here. So uh, our light, interior light, that is parented to the uh, planet, 
is illuminating our Fresnel material from the inside out. We want to get this uh, light fall off to be very bright, but we want it to fall out kind of at the rim, at the edge of the outside surface of our planet. So what we're going to do is we'll go to our point light settings, and we're going to increase the energy a little bit more uh, to 3. And uh, let's change our fall off from, um, I think right now it's at inverse square to constant. See where that gets us. You can see it brightens it up a little bit. I'm going to select the icosphere, and I'm going to uh, increase the size so that it kind of meets the edge a little bit better. You can see of our... Uh, light and uh, let's increase the light uh, setting a little bit more to uh, four let's see where that gets us and uh, that looks good for now we'll go with that uh, let's go to our icosphere again and uh, we want to go to our modifier stack we're in going to increase our subdivisions back to five just so we can see a little bit more clearly how this light mask is being applied. And uh, let's go back to our node setup for the uh, planet. And we're going to apply a color RGB curve. And we're going to apply this RGB curve to our rock material, bring this to the output. Now what we want to do is we want to generate what the interior... Um, uh, shadow, the ambient occlusion shadow is going to look like. So we're going to darken this way down. And I'm going to bring the highlights way down as well. Now I could just add a black color to this if we wanted to. Um, but we want to retain a little bit of this interior highlight. Uh, inside. So the best way to do that is to apply a curve in this way because we want to see a little bit of that interior specularity sticking through our shadows as if the light is bouncing around inside there. If we just apply a black color then our ambient occlusion will just go to black. It won't seem quite as realistic. Okay, So this will be our interior shadow. It's mostly black. Uh, we are then going to apply a color mix node to this and what we're going to do is we're going to mix together our shadow with our uh, original rock texture and we're going to use the light mask material as our factor input so wherever we have the light color inside of our material shining that will apply our uh, dark material to our uh, rock material. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to crank this up. We're going to go to our point, our light point. We're going to crank this up and control this by increasing the energy of our light. So let's move it up again to 5, 6, uh, 7. Let's take it all the way up to 10, see where that gets us. So you can start to see how just the rim is illuminated now. Let's go all the way up to 15. And maybe even a little bit higher, maybe up to 20. So this might not be exactly like what we had in the original, but you can see the idea, what's happening here. Uh, let's play around with maybe the fall-off uh, type. We'll go to um, our back to our original inverse square, see where that gets us. And that's not quite what we want. Let's go back to uh, inverse linear C, kind of trial and error, kind of like the constant the best. And maybe we can play around a little bit with our um, icosphere size a little bit more, scale it down a little bit more. So we get to this to a point where it really looks just right. And maybe we want to... Um, let's, let's add maybe a color to our light mask. So we'll add a, a uh, actually let's add a, an RGB curve to it. 
And on the curve, we can uh, maybe darken it a little bit. See how this helps. Yeah, I don't know how I like that. Maybe we can take the light end and bring it down a little bit. So you want to play around with this until you get it just right. It looks, you get just the right amount of detail in there, uh, but you still see some clear ambient occlusion going on. Maybe we'll bring up the light in the middle. Maybe something like this. So we do see a little bit of that light bouncing around on the lower edge, but there we go. We can see now that we have a little bit of that light bouncing around in there, but, but we're getting clearer ambient occlusion inside of these crevices. So something, something like this. Uh, in addition to that, we could add some additional color correction if we wanted to, to change the color of this. Maybe add uh, to the final output. Um, let's add a, another RGB curve. And on this curve to the whole thing, let's apply a little bit of a, uh, little bit of a contrast to bring out the uh, highlight a little bit of this, uh, edge so you get the idea of what we're doing here and uh, that looks good for now we'll take that so uh, very very similar to what we had you want to play around with those settings until you get your material uh, just right now as uh, someone uh, was claiming on uh, a recent uh, post that you know, well, this takes a whole lot of time to do a lot of setup in the uh, front end, and you're really not saving any time uh, in rendering versus using cycles or some other render engine. I think that's foolish, uh, quite frankly, because, you know, think about it. If you're using cycles, you're, you're spending just as much time uh, getting your material set up just right. Um, you know, I don't buy that at all. Uh, using any other ray traced uh, render engine, you're using just as much time uh, to get your materials perfect. Um, you know, materials are materials, and you're going to spend time getting them just right. Uh, this is no different than that. The only difference in our node uh, setup here is that we're, we're considering more things. Rather than moving lights around in the scene, we're moving textures around uh, on our materials in order to get our lighting. No different. Um, in order to get our shadow just right, we're moving textures around versus moving lighting. Uh, you know, it's no different. In order to get the color right, we're still using the same kinds of node setup. So, again, it's no different. Uh, so I don't really buy that argument. Um, but be aware that this is not some kind of series that is put out to put down Cycles or any other render engine. Cycles is just another ray traced render, render engine. It is, uh, it is more versatile than the Blender internal. It is better than the Blender internal, therefore making it kind of the new standard for Blender. Um, you know, but it is still a ray traced render engine that, uh, uh renders incredibly high quality uh, output, and because of that high quality output, you get a trade-off in time. What we're doing is we're pushing the limits of uh, OpenGL to decrease our time but get a higher quality output uh, from what you normally would get from just using the Blender game uh, sorts of applications. These materials would not be useful in a, in a game engine. These require a little bit more time for the uh, 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 GLSL and OpenGL engine to render out. Uh, this is kind of a split. Uh, this is a, a kind of halfway point between using game engine technology but getting a higher result. Okay, We're trading off a little bit on both sides to kind of meet uh, our, our terms a little bit in the middle. And that's what OpenGL sorts of compositing software does. Uh, especially those that are using OpenGL to make objects uh, such as Element 3D for uh, um, uh, After Effects or hit film uh and and the uh, some some of the 
uh, OpenGL object options that are in that. Uh, we could play around with more of these settings to get it just right, maybe change our, our point light just a little bit more, some of the energy uh, to get a little bit more of that highlight. Just making that one change gives us a little bit more definition in there. So anyway, you get the idea how this is done. Uh, now what we would do is we would uh, move this around in space, set it in our scene. Whoops, that's not what we want to do. Uh, control Z, I just moved my light out of the way. Uh, we would move our object around in our scene and place it where we would want. Uh, we could also then create uh, particles, a particle system of uh, asteroids inside of our scene. And we could just apply this exact same uh, uh, texturing to those particles. And we could come up with the same uh, sorts of results that we see in our planet output. So all these are are particle systems with one object, another icosphere with um, uh, some modifiers applied to it uh, to create sort of this uh, uh, sort of, <laughs> I don't know, a, a potato-y looking uh, uh, object uh, that can stand in for an asteroid. And we just apply the exact same materials and it gives us all the same lighting. Uh, now one trick that I applied here, and uh, we're not going to do it, but I'll explain it here if we open this up bigger. Over here where you can see where these uh, asteroids are kind of in the shadow of our planetary object, I just added a point light. And remember uh, that uh, we have that light mask material in the scene. If I apply the light mask material to these asteroids in the same way, wherever I place a light, it will create generate shadow. And if I make a very subtle light uh, point over here, it creates the essence of a shadow casting onto these asteroids over here. So you can see how this was put together. It's just a particle system. Uh, we all know how to do that. Uh, a couple of uh, cubes set in space. Each one has a particle system with the particles rotating. Uh, zero gravity. And uh, the uh, same uh, exact materials that I created for one object applied to these. So uh, you can see uh, what's been done uh, in order to create this scene. Now, um, uh, one last thing I'll do here, just to show you uh, a couple more options. Let's uh, let's bring in uh, another. Actually, we'll use our GLSL toolkit. We're going to import an image as planes. You can uh, uh, enable this add-on, import images as planes, so that you could find it in the import settings. Uh, but the uh, GLSL toolkit provides it here. We'll add a, a texture. Uh, I have a star field texture that we used in the earlier. Uh, tutorial. Grab onto this one here. Uh, make it shadeless. Use alpha Z transparency. Import this image as planes. Uh, we will rotate it on the X axis 90 degrees. Scale it up. It is a shadeless texture again. And we'll move it back in Y space to give us sort of a background to work with. Uh, we can apply a halo sort of atmosphere to this planet. So uh, what we might do is we will grab, uh, we'll import another image as a plane, and we'll grab this from my shadeless lighting pack. I have an image in here that looks like uh, this. I made this in uh, GIMP, and it's just a fall-off sort of effect, this halo with a dark center, and then it uh, increases all the way to white with a soft outside kind of glow to it. We'll grab this. We'll import it as a shadeless material as well. And if you remember, um, rotate this on the x-axis, 90 degrees. If you remember from the first uh, tutorial, uh, we could apply this uh, as a material that adds to our scene. If we go to the Blender game engine, and if I go to the material settings over here, I can change the alpha blend mode from uh, alpha blend to add, and it will now add to the rest of our scene. Uh, now if I select on our camera, you can see we have some alpha transparency problems. Now remember uh, that we have this new add-on. I could parent these and unparent them to an empty to ch uh, change my draw order, or I could just select my objects that are relevant in the scene. And uh, what I will do, all of my objects here, I will uh, recalculate the draw order using my new, uh, this new GLSL toolkit. Okay, so we're now able to do this on the fly very quickly. And now all of my 
um, uh, shading is proper. Now the other thing that I could do is that if I'm only dealing with this one object it, with all of the others, I could just change the blending mode for my halo object and I could change it to uh, something like um, in the uh, object settings I could change it to something like uh, transparent and it will make this one transparent over all others or I could apply the X-ray ability. And if I didn't have a bunch of objects in the scene, I can do something really cool. What I'm going to do is I'm going to um, snap this to the center of my uh, planet. So if I go to my Icosphere planet and I go to Object Settings, click on, uh, go to Snap and, and select Cursor to Select It. It'll put my cursor in the center. Now if I select on my Halo and I go to the object settings and I click snap, I can snap my uh, selection to cursor and it will place it right in the middle of my uh, planet. If I go to my camera view, now what I want to do is on my uh, halo I'm going to apply a constraint and actually I want to uh, parent this halo to my icosphere but I want to apply a constraint and this constraint is going to be a track to constraint and it will track the uh, halo to my camera and uh, what I want to do is play around with these settings until I get it so that it faces the camera wherever the camera goes my halo will follow that uh, direction you see how this works uh, now as long as my icosphere is not too close to the camera. Once it gets too close to the camera, uh, you can see how this will kind of come out of. Uh, whoops! It will kind of come out of the, uh, you know, perspective here. Uh, as long as I don't get too close to the camera, it will apply this halo as if it's kind of an atmospheric effect to my uh, planet. Now my halo is lit up a little bit too much, this atmosphere. Let me uh, enlarge it a little bit. Oh, wrong thing. Control Z. Have my planet selected. Select the halo will increase the size a little bit. And uh, I'm going to apply to this uh, uh, shading so that we can make it look like this is accepting the same lights as the uh, planet. So we'll go to the texture settings here and I'm going to apply another texture slot and I'm just going to use the same texture that I used for my um, shadow and we'll apply one, we'll apply another one here, same thing, texture, and then we'll apply one on the right, same thing, which was texture 2 I believe. And that gives us now the same shading that we had uh, before. Might want to change my uh, constraint a little bit because it does kind of bring it off kilter. Maybe I'll change the influence to 0 0.5. See if that helps us a little bit. That yeah, doesn't really help us out a whole lot. Hard to say. Maybe I'll disable my constraint entirely and we'll just rotate it on the z-axis I could uh, you know maybe something we could do here is uh, I'll, I'll go to my camera click on uh, snap the cursor to the uh, camera and uh, let's create real quick a an empty and I'm gonna parent the empty to the camera but I'm going to move the uh, empty back on the y-axis way back here in space and we will parent or rather I will uh, on my halo I will set this track to to that empty instead of to the camera and that might help a little bit better that looks a little bit better okay so now we can take our halo Scale it down a little bit. And uh, I'm going to go to the uh, material settings for the halo. And we will enable nodes. Go to the node editor. We'll select the uh, halo texture. So it comes back. 
And now we can add a little bit of a color correction to this. We'll add uh, a color uh, curves. And maybe we'll bring down the color a little bit. Uh, go to the blue side and bring it up a little bit. Make it kind of a bluish color. Bring up the green side a little bit. And maybe we'll take some of the reds out of it. Go back here. Bring down the color a little bit more. Bring down the highs a little bit more. And now you can see what we've created. If we go to the uh, camera view and we click on uh, only render in our display, you can see that now we've created sort of an atmosphere that will follow around our object. Now, this gets a little bit dicey using the uh, x-ray option because uh, if you had other transparent objects in the scene, you would have to use your uh, recalculate draw order tricks to get everything uh, in the right uh, order here. But you can see kind of how this is uh, put together. might want to delete a couple of vertices around the outside edge here or uh, mask this off because you can see you see a little bit of an artifact on the edge. But the end result, uh, once you do some of those things, will get you something that looks like this. So you can see that we have this atmosphere applied to our uh, scene or our uh, planet and uh, we have our uh, asteroid set in there a little bit of a light masking applied to it to get some extra shadow uh, and we can uh, use this uh, same material over and over again for our asteroids and for our planet and uh, this is another way to apply shadeless uh, type materials inside of a uh, uh, an open GL scene so there are no lights being used in this for conventional lighting everything is shadeless uh, except for the light masking so um, hopefully uh, you find this uh, type of technique useful. You can use these light masks to uh, create shadows and ambient occlusion and other settings too. It works out really perfectly because this is a spherical object and uh, the uh, point light has a spherical fall off. So it's just uh, how I did it. And you can see how quickly this will uh, render on uh, playback now. So as this plays back we could have animation in there and even the render is super quick if I render one uh, one image there it's just one second much quicker than using the uh, ambient occlusion that has been added uh, to the uh, gooseberry uh, versions uh, gooseberry builds that are coming out so uh, a new trick that you can use uh, and that's how we accomplish that with the objects in the scene so we've covered the uh, nebula we've covered uh, the uh, flare we've colored the star field a three-dimensional star field we've covered the planet and uh, and we've talked about uh, how to do uh, these asteroids one object as a particle system a couple of particle systems in place here and uh, we've now covered the whole scene so uh, everything that I've shown you can now be applied and you can create a scene that looks like this uh, but this is not the end of the series we're going to continue the series uh, as I uh, have new uh, ideas. I will uh, add more episodes to this and this will be an open-ended series. When I decide that it's done and we've kind of exhausted all of our uh, options, I'll let you know. Um, but um, this uh, brings us to the end of this project. Uh, you can now uh, put the project that looks like this together. Uh, spend a little bit more time on your light masking, get a little bit more detail in there. Uh, but essentially that's how it was created and uh, that's how I got these results. So uh, again, high definition results with just a, a couple of seconds of render time uh, using OpenGL and GLSL uh, options. So uh, that's all I got for you today. I hope you find this useful and I wish all of you happy blending.